Hi, Rashonda here, Rashonda's reading room. Pauline Hopkins, Hagar's daughter, chapter 14. I am fascinated about what is coming up. Let's read it. Chapter 14, Renewing Old Acquaintance. So it has occurred to me, um, maybe for the past few chapters, that the chapters are named and starting the book, the chapters didn't have titles. I think that's interesting. I wonder what made her change. Chapter eight, no title. Chapter nine, title. Oh, they started getting titled when it was 20 years later. That's interesting. I guess she started with 20 years later and felt like she just had to keep going. Hmm. Okay. Chapter 14, Renewing Old Acquaintance. The following afternoon, Major Madison's carriage rolled up to the Bowen Mansion on 16th Street and stopped. From it, Aurelia stepped, clad richly and daintily in a becoming calling costume. She had determined to, to storm the citadel, as it were, and carry it by assault. She rang the bell and asked the footman if Miss Bowen was at home. Yes, Miss. What name, please? She gave the man a card on which she had written, known to you as Aurelia Walker. And was she... All right, and was shown into a morning room to wait. Would Jewel recognize her, she wondered? Would she be pleased to meet her again? Presently, she heard the gentle frou-frou of silken skirts down the broad stairway, and the next instant, Jewel Bowen stood before her, holding out her hand in frankly, clad rec in frankly glad recognition. Jewel in a tea gown that was a poem, a combination of palest rose satin and cream lace. Surprise and pleasure mingled in her speaking face. The card said Aurelia Walker. Can it be possible that you are the same Aurelia whom I knew in Montreal? How delightful to meet you again. Her greeting was most cordial and put Aurelia instantly at ease. After a time spent recalling reminiscences of school life and pleasant girlish chatter, Aurelia said, I must explain the change in name. Papa was embarrassed financially and he placed me at a school calling himself Walker. Well, he earned the money to satisfy his creditors. That saved him much annoyance. And as soon as he could satisfy their demands, we resumed our rightful name. Pray do not speak of it, Aurelia. Such things are annoying, but cannot always be helped, replied Jewel with a smile. Won't you come to the drawing room and meet Mama? How beautiful everything was, thought the girl as she passed up the broad marble stairs with velvet carpet in the center on which the foot fell noiselessly and statues and flowers and niches and on landings while the walls were hung with lovely frescoes that impelled one to pause and admire. The stairs were made out of marble? I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting marble staircases. My goodness, that is fancy as well as schmancy. The drawing room door was flung open and they were in a spacious apartment with painted ceiling and all things rich and harmonious in tone. In a moment, she was standing before Mrs. Bowen who greeted her warmly as if truly glad to meet her daughter's school friend. No lovelier vision was ever seen than these two girls as they entered the Bowen drawing room. Mrs. Bowen was a cultured lady and their grace and beauty gratified her taste. She conversed freely and pleasantly with the unexpected guest, although after the first feeling of wonder and satisfaction at so much loveliness, she was surprised and puzzled at the vague feeling of distrust and dislike that personal contact with her young guest brought her. It was intangible. She shook it off, however, the beautiful face and voice were so enchanting that she could not resist them and felt ashamed of her distrust. Uh, sometimes you cannot trust things that are beautiful. Sometimes you absolutely can, sometimes you cannot, and you should not automatically distrust things that are not beautiful. Let's keep reading. Come and sit down by the fire and let us have a long chat before anyone else comes in. We never know how long we may be alone, said Jewel, indicating a seat near her own. This is very cozy and homelike, remarked Aurelia as she took the seat offered. I have been so lonely since I came to the city. Poor child, remarked Mrs. Bowen in a sympathetic voice. Are you very much alone? How long since you lost your mother? I cannot recall her at all, dear Mrs. Bowen, the girl answered, lifting a pair of dusky eyes, swimming in tears for a moment to her face. 
Is there a reason we keep hearing dusky, 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 dusky? Don't forget, this is 20 years later, and we do not know what happened to Hagar or her daughter. <laughs> okay. <sighs> I cannot recall her at all, dear Mrs. Bowen, the girl answered, lifting a pair of dusky eyes, swimming in tears for a moment to her face. Papa is so intent on the fortunes of the mine just at present that he gives me very little attention. Indeed, I believe he forgets at times that he has a daughter. This last with a little sigh of martyrdom. I actually don't believe that Aurelia's words are disingenuous, but I do believe the emotion she is trying to elicit from them perhaps are. Let's keep going. Mrs. Bowen melted more and more to her guest. Then stay and dine with us. Let me send away your carriage. She rang the bell and gave the order to the servant. We have a few jolly people coming. Not a dinner party, you know, but just a few friends. I shall be delighted. How kind you are, replied Aurelia, feeling dizzy over her good luck. Thanks, said Jewel, pressing her hand. Here comes tea and with it, Papa. Senator Bowen welcomed his guest with his usual Western heartiness. By Jove, he thought to himself, she's a stunner. But my little girl doesn't lose a thing by contrast. What a sight for sore eyes the pair of them makes. So, and remember, the pair of them is like a white lily, which is jewel, versus a tropical flower, which is Aurelia. They look beautiful together, each distinct in their own beauty, but both complement to each other. So that's what we have. I am so excited for Cuthbert Sumner to walk in on the two of them. I don't even know what to do with myself. Let's keep reading. Then he remarked aloud to the guest. I know your father, my dear. I shall try and see more of him after this. My daughter's friends are my friends. There were, besides Aurelia, four people to whom Mrs. Bowen introduced her. Two of them, the secretary of the treasury and his wife, she knew by sight. But Mr. Carroll West and a, pretty, and a pretty widow, Mrs. Brewer, were total strangers. Lord Browning, the English ambassador, and Lady Browning were shortly announced, and quickly following them came Cuthbert Sumner completing the party. This is my dear friend, Aurelia Madison, Cuthbert. We were at school together. You remember that I told you at the theater her face seemed very familiar to me. This is a dear friend. According to what Aurelia said, they barely knew each other at school. That may or may not be true, but she's clearly not your dear friend. You just rolled up on her. And let's see how Cuthbert reacts. Delighted to meet you again, Miss Madison, he said as he bowed over her hand, suppressing a start of amazement at the sight of her. To himself, he added, confound the woman. What does she mean? Is she following me up? That won't help her any. I am happy, he said, delighted to meet you again. Because if he had just all of a sudden pretended he had never seen her before and didn't know her, I was going to be angry. I mean, he hasn't said anything, but at least he said again, thank you, Cuthbert Sumner. Thank you. <sighs> Aurelia thoroughly ingratiated herself with Lady Browning, paying her the greatest deference. Finding her ladyship much interested in religious topics and charitable projects, she affected an enthusiastic interest in them and was rewarded by overhearing Lady, Brown Lady Browning express herself as delighted with Miss Madison. Such a beautiful girl and so intelligent to talk with. People will think you're pretty and smart if you listen to them talk about the stuff they like all the time, which I suppose is a tale on myself. Like, I guess I think you all are pretty and smart because you are listening to me talk about the stuff that I like. Hmm. All right. She went down to dinner with Mr. West, who seemed much impressed with his lovely partner. Cuthbert's attention would wander to the couple opposite him at table. West was talking to her with animation while Aurelia smiled and sparkled and looked irresistibly bewitching. West had but a small income for a wealthy man and had always been incorrigible until now, but he seemed to have surrendered at last. Cuthbert watched her covertly, not at all deceived by the gaiety of her manner. So the moth is still fluttering about the flame. Let her beware. I would sacrifice her without a moment's hesitation if I thought she meant jewel harm. Hmm. Let's read that again. So this is internal monologue happening for Cuthbert. 
So the moth is still fluttering about the flame. Let her beware. I would sacrifice her without a moment's hesitation if I thought she meant jewel harm. Glad to hear it, intrigued by it. He showed nothing of this outwardly, being as calm, smiling, and well-bred as ever, but he was seriously annoyed by the inscrutable conduct of the woman opposite him. It was a vague feeling that he could not grasp, a shadow no larger than a man's hand. Dinner over, the gentleman did not linger long behind the ladies. Back in the drawing room once more, Mrs. Bowen whispered to her husband, do ask Miss Madison to play, Zenas. I will when I get a chance. Wes seems to have such a lot to say to her that it would be cruel to spoil sport. Mrs. Bowen looked and laughed. I'll ask her myself then. Miss Madison, I am sure you are musical, she said to the girl with a smile. Will you not favor us? Aurelia Cign I love that like, yes, you play the piano or piano forte or whatever instrument it is they have. I'm assuming it's a piano, but like you are of our class. You are our people. Clearly you play. Clearly you have things memorized that you can pull up and play at a moment's notice. And clearly you've done this before. So it's not even awkward or embarrassing for you. Clearly you are accustomed to having learned to be a showpiece because that is what we do with the women of our class and time. Because let's not think that a woman was encouraged to be musical simply for the fact that she may enjoy music. No. All right, let's keep going. Aurelia signified her willingness and Mr. West a minute later had installed her at the piano and stood by listening with delight to her playing. And she was worth listening to for she was a cultured amateur of no mean ability and gave genuine pleasure by her performance. Mr. West was more and more infatuated each moment he spent in her society. Mrs. Bowen thanked her warmly as she rose from the instrument followed by the plaudits of the company. Miss Madison said the pretty widow, you play beautifully. Do I, Gary Aurelia laughing, but then I cannot sing. Jewel can though, divinely I hear. Flatterer, said Jewel as she passed Aurelia's seat on her way to the piano attended by Sumner. Who is it to be, he asked as he turned over the contents of a folio. Will you choose Cuthbert? A jealous pang shot through Aurelia's heart as her ear caught the words, but she set her teeth hard. Sumner took from the folio some day by Wellington. Always a favorite of mine, you know, he said. She gave him a quick trustful look and smiled as she began the accompaniment. Conversation was hushed. Everyone listened while the rich, pure voice filled the room, giving the old song with the dramatic fire of a professional. There was a buzz of admiration when Jewel had finished. Cuthbert bent over with pride and delight shining in his face and his softly spoken, thanks sweetheart, was heard distinctly by the woman sorely tried by jealous pain. So he said, thanks sweetheart and Aurelia certainly caught it. Don't leave the piano, sing something else came from all parts of the room. Very well, she said, and then gave the delicious pathos that sweet old song, Dreaming Eyes. The listeners were charmed. The singer rose, crossed the room and seated herself beside Aurelia. Their renewed acquaintance seemed destined to ripen into a close intimacy. Aurelia, the girl said as they sat there somewhat apart from the others, will you come with us to the theater tomorrow night? We have a box. Some surnames were dropped from that night. <laughs> so not Miss Bowen and Miss Madison. We have no more surnames. Surnames were dropped from that night. How did it happen? How did it happen? How did it happen? Circe alone knew. But after that, those two were much together. Such a lovely morning, Jewel. You must come for a turn with me. Or I shall be alone all day. Do come and make the hours bright for me. Sumner's first undefined fears gradually subsided. Time rolling on springs of pleasure passed swiftly bringing the night of the ball. Circe, I know my Greek mythology is, my Greek mythology isn't what it used to be. I'm trying to remember who Circe is. You know what, that's gonna be one of the questions we're gonna talk about. Who is Circe and why was she brought up here? Why this allusion to Circe? 
So anyway, that was chapter 14 of Hagar's Daughter by Pauline Hopkins. Until next time. <laughs>